Good morning. Welcome again to Morning Devotions. I'm Pastor Samuel, the pastor of the Cathedral of Praise. And as we get started today, let's get back to Psalms chapter 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He will save you from the polar snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His feathers, and under His wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. He will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plug that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you make the most high your dwelling, even the Lord who is my refuge, then no harm will befall you, no disaster will come near your tent. For he will command his angels concerning you, to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. He will tread upon the lion and the cobra. He will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord. I will rescue him, I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call upon me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble, I will deliver him and honor him. With long life will I satisfy him and show him my salvation. One of the beautiful gifts that God has given into the life of Sister Bev and Shah and I is a relationship with Brother John and Sister Pat. And part of the beauty of that relationship is their love for you. It would be very, it would be impossible for me to have a friendship with someone who didn't care about you because you're such a big part of our lives. I mean, forgive me, we've given our lives for over 40 years now to being your pastor, watched you grow up. And all of that to say this, Brother John's really been praying for you lately and we've been working on something for quite a few months at the church and I want you to pray about this with us. I'm very concerned about full employment when this thing finishes. I'm not convinced that a lot of the layoffs are over, okay? I mean, we, I don't think we've seen the end of the economic problems of this. And I think this, this is why I keep telling you, live simply, save cash. Live simply, save cash. Live simply, save cash. Because I, I'm not sure the economic impact of this thing is, has really come to a bottom yet. Now, I believe that God will bless us and it will be well with us, but there are some practical things that we need to do, like live simple, save cash. But another thing that we need to do is begin to work on helping people find employment. We, we want to put together a group of people in the church, and your ministry is, for lack of a better term, job matching. Helping your brothers and sisters present themselves and find jobs. Recru doing recruiting for other companies to help our members find work, find out what training programs we need to do. Like, do you remember when call centers first came into the country? We, we put together a, a, an ILS course for all of our members, and it was free because people were charging so much money to get those cert certifications. Well, maybe we need to look at some different types of training programs now, some things that we can do as a church on a practical level, not just say be warmed and filled, but on a practical level, things that we can do to help the people who need help the most. Now, I, I know many of you, this is, ah, everything is great, Pastor, but many of our people really need some help with this. So maybe we need to develop some training programs, maybe a job match program, but I'd like you to pray with us about this because we need to take care of our members. See, it's one thing to teach our people but it's another thing to actually say, all right, let's get let's get together and help some folks. It's, it's not enough just to pray for people. It's not enough just to say, be warmed and filled. Is there something practical that we can do to serve our members in this way? Father, we come in Jesus' name. Lord, we realize that employment is going to begin to be a larger and a larger issue. And the types of jobs are going to begin to be a larger and a larger issue. Father, I ask in Jesus' name that you give us wisdom, wisdom on how to put this job match program together, that you touch the hearts of members, Lord, that have abilities in these areas and wisdom in these areas and giftings in these areas. And, and Lord, we, we see them come to the forefront and take leadership in all of this. 
We ask you for the laborers for this, Lord. We ask you for the wisdom for this and for the finances for this. But Father, we ask you to give us a heart. Give all of our people a heart to help those that are hurting the worst in this time. We thank you for it, Father. Now, Lord, I want to lift you all of our seniors today and all of the young people that are still locked at home. Father, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I thank you. I thank you that no sickness, no pestilence shall come near their dwelling places. I thank you that you just keep their bodies strong and healthy and their lungs clear and free in Jesus' name. And Father, I ask that you just lift their heads and encourage them. Father, as we've learned how you revive the soul these last few weekends, Lord, I ask that you reach into their hearts right now. Restore their souls. Bring gladness back into their hearts, Lord. Let joy. Lord, the world can't give joy. Put your joy in the hearts of the young people. Put your joy in the heart of the seniors that are still locked in. Put your heart, your joy in the heart of our family members that are working so hard and they're just exhausted through all of this thing. Let your joy come within them, Father. Put your gladness in them and give them strength. Strengthen their bodies and strengthen their souls. And Father, revive their souls. Father, there are men that just don't know if they can keep going. They've done everything they know to do and they don't know what to do next. Lord, I ask, revive their will. Revive the desires. Revive their, their decision-making ability and all those executive functions. Father, revive their souls in the name of Jesus and let clear direction flow to their lives. I thank you for it, Father. Oh, let your hand rest upon them. Let your hand bring restoration to souls, Lord. We thank you for restoring our bodies to full health. But Lord, we also need our souls restored. Oh, Father, restore the souls. Restore souls. Lift discouraged heads, Father. Lift their heads and fill their hearts with gladness. And Father, <laughs> oh, just give them a dance. Lord, take away the spirit of mourning and let them just begin to dance before you in their homes. Even if all they can do is a chicken dance like me, Lord, let dance flow back into their hearts. Lord, as they worship you with full abandon like King David of old, let joy just flow like a river through their souls today and lift them and encourage them. Brighten their eyes again, Father. I thank you for it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's open up our hearts now and spend some time in worship.
Our New Testament passage today picks up with 1 John chapter 5. It said, this is he who came by the water and by the blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. Now, the water, that would be natural birth. The blood, he poured out his blood. His sufferings. And the water and the blood. Now, there's lots of different views on this passage of Scripture. Some say that means the Holy Spirit and the, the crucifixion. But, you know, most scholars put this natural birth, water. The water burst first. And the blood, Jesus Christ. Not by the water only, but by the water and the blood. Because Jesus gave his blood. And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. So there are three that testify. The Spirit the water, and the blood, and these three agree. If we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater. For the testimony, for this is the testimony of God that he bore concerning his Son. Whoever believes in the Son of God has the testimony in himself. Whoever does not believe God has made him, referring to God, a liar. When you refuse to believe God and what God says about Jesus, then you're calling God a liar. Now, sometimes just people need to just understand. When you say that you don't believe what God said about his son, you're calling God a liar. I don't think I ever want to call God a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that he has borne concerning his son. And this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life and this life is in his son. Whoever has the son has life, and whoever does not have the son does not have life. Okay, that's just real simple. <laughs> There's no life apart from the son. Jesus is the only way. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, that you may know. Do you remember we keep talking about things to know? We know. This is adding to your list, okay? This is a list. Add to the things. This is what we know. You can open in your little journal things the Bible says we know. And just make one page of that and just from time to time go back and read all these verses of the things we know. If you believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Okay, now, oh, brothers and sisters, the confidence that we have toward him. What is my confidence toward God? That if I ask anything according to his will, he hears us. That's confidence, brothers and sisters. When we just prayed a little while ago, if we pray according to his will, this is the confidence we have. He hears us. And here's another we know, and we know. Here's another we know. We know that he hears us in whatever we ask. We know that we have the request that we've asked of him. All right, so here's answered prayer. The surety of answered prayer. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death, there is a sin that leads to death. But I do not say that one should pray for that. All right, now there's a question mark. You look at that and you go, okay, now wait a minute. I don't get that verse. There's a lot of sins, brothers and sisters, that we all commit every day, and they don't lead to death. Pray for people. When you see them doing something wrong, notice if you see. You see, as much as people want to keep sins secret, they're not very secret because we have relationships with people. When you see a brother committing a sin, not leading to death, ask and God will give him life. Now, they have to ask for forgiveness themselves, but there'll be a flow of life that will come to them. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death, there is a sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. 
There are sins that you can do that lead you to total separation from God. And remember, death equals separation from God. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is a sin that does not lead to death. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. But he who is born of God protects him. This is Jesus. And the evil one does not touch him. All right, here is all those limits that we've been preaching about lately. God's limits, God's protection. Do you remember how Jim Jesus said, I protected those that you entrusted to me? Jesus is still protecting us. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Now, wow. That's a wow. When you, you sit on a jeepney today, and you look upon the people in that jeepney, and then you get off the jeepney and you see the crowds of people moving toward work, walking down the street, the whole world lies in the power, under the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true and we are in him, there's that in Christ, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. There's only one true God. Only one true God. Little children, keep yourself from idols. Now, let me read that to you, New Living. Dear children, keep away from anything that might take God's place in your heart, because that's all idolatry is. An idol can be a microphone. An idol can be a car. An idol can be a coffee cup. An idol is just something that you lift your heart to and that you begin to focus your heart upon, that you you turn your faith in. <laughs> this is why we don't put our trust in the riches of this world. That means those riches have become an idol to us. We think that they're our source and our provision. And they're not. There is only one true God. He is the true God and eternal life. All right, let's open up our hearts. And there's so much in here, and I had to move through it quickly because we've got Daniel again today. So we'll be back in just a minute, but let's open up our hearts and spend some more time in worship. Like a star in the sky On a cloudy, windy night Though the sky seems to change The star remains Oh, your promises, oh God they will never fade Though everything else change Your word remains I will trust in you I will trust in you I will trust in you Those who trust in will never be dismayed for you Lord are with us till the end I will trust him and you on this cornerstone I have placed my trust my heart is at peace, my mind at rest. You're the Lord, the Lord, the eternal rock. In reminding me your word, you never fail. I will trust in you. I will trust in you. Trust Emmanuel. 
Testament passage today picks up in Daniel chapter 11, verse 1. Now, I have to be honest with you. It would be very easy for me just to start preaching sermons out of this, but our purpose is to be devotional. So how do I pull all of this out devotionally and still give you an understanding of it? Well, first of all, I want you to remember the different kingdoms that Daniel has already talked about us. We've talked about the Babylonian kingdom, We talked about the Medo-Persian kingdom. Then we're going to talk about Greece. Then we're going to talk about the Roman. And then we're going to talk about the revived Roman. All right. Now, this would be the Antichrist empire. Okay. So these are the kingdoms that Daniel prophesies about for the future. Okay. Now, remember, Daniel has lived through the Babylonian And Daniel has lived through how many of the Medo-Persian, and we're going to see here three more kings arise in Persia. You know, Daniel lives through how many changes of leadership and still retains his powerful position. And part of the reason for that is when people inspected him, as they say, it says earlier in Daniel, when they tried to find something wrong with him, there is no corruption and there's no negligence. Daniel was not just an honest man. He was also not a negligent man. And there there are many people that are very honest, but they're negligent, all right? So let's begin to read through this and try to stay devotional, all right? And now I will show you the truth. Behold, three more kings shall arise in Persia. This is the Medo-Persian Empire. And the fourth shall be far richer than them all, all right? So the last equals the greatest. And when he has become strong through his riches, ah, now, there's the devotional part. When he becomes strong through his riches, wealth makes people strong when it comes to politics. A political truth. I did not say a spiritual truth. I said a political truth. He becomes strong through his riches. You see, a, a king can buy tanks, he can buy airplanes, he can buy, you know, money Money drives the military machine. So 
in that day, kings became strong because they had the money for huge military operations. I did not say this is a spiritual truth, but it is a political truth. And he shall stir up all against the kingdom of Greece. Now, notice, Medo-Persian Empire wants to attack Greece. Now is the time when Greek, Greece becomes the world empire. Then a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with great dominion and do as he wills. This is Alexander the Great. As soon as he has risen, his kingdom shall be broken and divided into the four winds of the heaven, but not to his posterity. Remember, Alexander the Great died young and his kingdom was broken up into four territories and none of them were given to his children because he died so young nor according to the authority with which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up and go to others besides these. Then the king of the south shall become strong, but one of his princes shall be stronger than he, and he shall rule. Now we begin to hear what happens to these four different territories of Alexander the Great. And this deals with the Ptolemies and all of this. We won't get into all of that, because that would take a long time to teach. Then the king of the south shall be strong, but one of his princes shall be stronger than he and shall rule. All right, so strength. Now, again, we're talking politics. Now we're not talking spirituality. Strength rules. Now, again, we're not talking spiritual things. We're talking politics. And his authority shall be a great authority. After some years, they shall make an alliance, and the daughter of the king of the south shall come to the king of the north and make an agreement. But she shall not retain the strength of her arm. He and her arms shall not endure, but she shall be given up, and her attendants, he who fathered her, and he who supported her in those times. And from a branch from her roots shall run arise in his place, from her roots, from this daughter of the king of the south. And again, this is, I, I should put names on all this, but we can do that in a Bible study one week, or a theology week. He shall come against the army and enter the fortress of the king of the north, and he shall deal with them, and they, he shall prevail. He shall carry off to Egypt their gods and their metal images, their precious vessels of silver and gold, and for some years he shall refrain in attacking the king of the north. Then the latter shall come to the, into the realm of the king of the south, but shall return to his own land. His sons shall wage war and assemble a great multitude of forces, which shall keep coming and overflow and pass through, and they shall carry the war as far as his fortress. Now notice, keep coming, overflow, and pass through. Uh, this is the land of Israel. Now, one of the things that you have to understand about these four territories fighting back and forth, this is one of the things that brought incredible devastation to the land because it became the battlefield for all of these guys. The king of the south moved with rage, and he shall come out and fight with the king of the north, and he shall raise a great multitude, but he shall be given into his hand. And when the multitude is taken away, his heart shall be exalted, and he shall cast down tens of thousands, but he shall not prevail. The king of the north shall again raise a multitude greater than the first. And after some years, he shall come on with a great army and abundant supplies. All right, now notice. Success in battle requires a great army. Now, we're not talking spiritual things. Now, we're just talking carnal and abundant supplies. This is what makes you victorious. In those days, many shall rise against the king of the south, and the violent among your own people shall lift themselves up in order to fulfill the vision, but they shall fail. Notice, the violent from among your own people. This is Israel. Then the king of the north shall come and throw up siege works and take a well-fortified cities. Now, most scholars put this well-fortified city as Caesarea. And the forces of the south shall not stand, or even his best troops, for there shall be no strength to stand. But he who comes against him shall do as he wills, and none shall stand before him. And he shall stand in the glorious land, this is Israel, with destruction in his hand. And he shall set his face to come with the strength of his whole kingdom. And he shall bring terms of an agreement and shall perform them. And he shall give him a daughter of women to destroy the kingdom, but he shall not stand or be to his advantage. Afterward, he will turn his face to the coastlands and capture many of them. But a commander shall put an end to his insolence. Indeed, he shall turn his insolence back upon him. Then he shall turn his face against the fortresses of his own land, 
but he shall stumble and fall and shall not be found. All of this lays out the history if I put names to it for you. Then shall arise one in his place who shall send an extractor of tribute for the glory of the kingdom. But within days he shall be broken, neither in anger nor in battle. In his place shall arise a contemptible person. Now notice an exactor of tribute. Again, trying to take money from everybody. In his place shall rise a contemptible person to whom royal majesty has not been given. He shall come in without warning and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Wow. Now, here is a political takeover. Okay, notice. He's contemptible. There's no royal majesty given to him, but he obtains the kingdom by flatteries. He's he's a smooth tucker. <laughs> Armies shall be utterly swept away before him and broken, even the prince of the covenant. And from the time that alliance is made with him, he shall act deceitfully, and he shall become strong with small people. Now there's a question mark. How do you become strong with small people? Without warning, he shall come into the richest parts of the province, and he shall do what neither his fathers nor his forefathers, father's fathers have done, scattering among them plunder, spoil, and goods. He shall devise plans against strongholds, but only for a time. So this is a guy who is a taker. Now, one of the things you have to learn about political takeovers is they're only in it for money, all right? He shall stir up his power and his heart against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall wage war with exceeding with an exceeding great army, and he shall, but he shall not stand, for plots are devised against him. So why can he not stand? Because he's got plotters underneath him. He has betrayal underneath him. A kingdom divided, a divided kingdom cannot stand. This is why you have to drive the mockers out, you know. Even those who eat his food shall break him. Wow, those closest at his table. His army shall be swept away and many shall fall down slain. As for the two kings, their hearts are bent on doing evil. Now, there's a wower. These guys, they don't want to do good. They shall speak lies at the same table, but to no avail. For the end is yet to be at the time appointed. Now, you got to be careful with people who speak lies at the same table. Wow. And he shall return to his land with great wealth, but his heart shall be set against the holy covenant. And he shall work his will and return to his own land. At the appointed time, he shall return and come to the south, but it shall not be this time as it was before. For ships of Kittim shall come against him, and he shall be afraid and withdraw and shall turn back and be enraged, and take action against the holy covenant. He shall turn back and pay attention to those who forsake him. So now we need to, we're beginning to see a term come up. Now I could define this for you, but I won't because we'll do that in a, in a theology week. What is the holy covenant? These are question marks. What does it mean when he sets the stand against the holy covenant? Forces shall appear and profane the temple and the fortress. And they shall take away the regular burnt offering. All right. This is Jerusalem. And shall take away the regular burnt offering. And they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. All right. So an idol will be set up in the Holy of Holies. He shall reduce with flat, seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant. But the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. Wow. Now, this is why I've moved quickly through some of this, because I want to spend a few minutes with this. He shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant. Now, did you notice earlier a contemptible man? We're beginning to see a word flatteries. You wonder how people can get power. They seduce with flatteries. You wonder how a, an intelligent man can be manipulated. Seduction with flattery. He shall be seduced with flattery those who violate the covenant. But now notice, but the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. Now here is a great truth. 
in this world that, how to stand against deception. People who know their God shall stand firm and take action. In this world that we live in today, and really the last days, one of the, one of the biggest characteristics of the days that we live in today is deception. It's everywhere. I mean, that's how people sell. Market, forgive me if you're into marketing, marketing is based on it. It's deception. You know, it's, it's like walking in to buy a house and it looks newly painted and it's beautiful and you think, man, I can move in and not have to do anything. But when you move in and you try to hang the first picture on the wall and you start to nail it, you find out the only thing there is paint because termites have eaten everything behind it. You were deceived by a facade. <laughs> you were deceived by a facade. And now you remember, they said, don't lean on the walls, we just painted them. <laughs> How do you overcome the seduction, the deception of flattery? You know God. See, the more you get with God, the more you're going to be able to stand in the midst of deception. When they stumble, they shall receive a little help. And many will join themselves to them with flattery. Ah. How to grow a false movement. A false barcada. How do you grow it? Why do people join? Because of flattery. And some of the wise shall stumble so that they may be refined, purified, and made white until the time of the end, for it awaits the appointed time. And the king shall do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods. He shall prosper. Ah, I hate that. Don't you? I mean, ah. He shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished, for what is decreed shall be done. Now, again, you just, you just hate that. A man is successful speaking against God. Ah, but you know what? God is very patient and God is very merciful. You know, the more I study the scriptures, the more I realize God's not like anybody we've ever met. <laughs> You see, he is so in control, he can even just step back and say, you know what, say whatever you want against me. He is so secure in his authority. These people don't intimidate him. They might intimidate us, but they don't intimidate him. They can say whatever they want to say. He, he, doesn't, he doesn't need to prove anything to anybody. He's God. He shall pay no attention to the God of his fathers. That, now look at this guy or to the one beloved by women. He shall not pay attention to any other God, for he shall magnify himself above all. Now, the God of his fathers. So evidently this guy came from Judaism. There is an ancestry of, of a true knowledge of God in his family, but he won't pay any attention to him. He shall honor the God of fortresses instead of these. <laughs> In other words, the God of power. And that's about the only other way to put it. I have fortresses. I have arms and weapons and fortresses. That's what I worship. I worship power and strength. A God whom his father did not know, he shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. He shall deal with the strongest fortresses with the help of a foreign god. Those who acknowledge him, he will load with honor. He shall make them rulers over many and shall divide the land for a price. All right, now notice. Power. Honors. Oh, my pen. Power honors those who bow. 
and he shall make them rulers. Power honors and power gives power to those who bow for a price. <laughs> All right. What are you going to give me? If I let you rule this kingdom, how much do I get? What tribute are you going to give me? At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him. But the king of the north shall rush upon him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and with many ships. And he shall come into the countries and shall overflow and pass through. He shall come into the glorious land. That's Israel. Tens of thousands shall fall, but these shall be delivered out of his hand. Edom, Moab, and the main part of the Ammonites. Now remember, these were all given land by God. Remember, Edom, that's the descendants of Esau. Moab, that's the descendants of Lot. Okay, And Ammonites, those are the descendants of Lot. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall become ruler of the treasuries of gold, silver, and all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Cushites shall follow in his train. But news from the east and the north shall alarm him. And he shall go out with great fury to destroy and devote many to destruction. And he shall pitch his palatial tents between the sea and the glorious mountain. And he shall come to his end with none to help him. I wish I had time to really teach through all of this, but we're just pulling out devotional thoughts. Chapter 12, verse 1. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people. This is Israel. Now you always have to remember there's an angel over nations. Gabriel or Michael is the angel over Israel. And there should be a time of trouble, such as never has been since the nation until that time. But at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. All right, so there's judgment. And those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who and turn many into righteousness like stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words, seal the book, until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall increase. These are characteristics of the last days. So we have travel. Maybe right now, not right now during COVID-19. And we have knowledge. An incredible burst of knowledge will happen at the end. Then I, Daniel, looked and behold, two others stood, one on the bank of the stream and one on the bank, on that bank of the stream. And someone said to the man clothed in linen who is above the waters of the stream, how long shall it be till the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen who is above the waters of the stream raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for time, times, and half a time. And that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. All right, now this is Israel. And this is one year, time, times, two years, and half a time. So three and one half years. Now here's prophetic statements about the destruction of Israel in the last half of the tribulation. I heard, but I did not understand. Then I said, O Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? He said, Go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up until the time of the end. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. And from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the abomination that makes the desolation set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1,335 days. All right, so there's three and one half years. Okay, we define it again. But go your way till the end, and you shall rest and shall stand in your allotted place at the end of days. Now, there's a couple of things I just want you to see here. There will come a period in the middle of the tribulation. Say if this is, let's put it down here. If this is the tribulation, okay, 
This is seven years. There is going to be a covenant signed for peace with Israel for the first three and a half years. Now, the tribulation is still ongoing, but the Antichrist signs a covenant of peace with Israel for the first three and a half years. At the midpoint, this is when he puts up the abomination of desolation, and then this is when Israel is driven from the land. And really, we put it together with other scriptures. They go out into the area of the Ammonites, and the Ammonites take them in. But the other thing I really want you to see here, Daniel, you shall rest and you shall stand in your allotted place at the end of times. At death, Daniel would rest. There will come a day when we lay this body down and our life from that point forward is going to be called rest. Now, then there's going to come a point where we stand. At the end of days. And there is an allotted place. Daniel has his place. He has a place. And we'll see Daniel one day. There is a place that is allotted for him to stand. This is his role. This is his function. This is what he will do at the end of days. You and I need to understand. In the millennial reign, we will rule and reign with Jesus. We know that King David will be the prince in the temple who leads the worship. And what a dream come true for King David. That he gets to lead the worship of the Messiah for a thousand years in the temple courts. David had a heart for the house of God. David had a heart for worship. Maybe some of you, your place will be to stand in the choir. I, I don't know. If I, if I just get to sit in a corner like a cockroach, I'll be happy. But there is a place set aside for you, a role that you have to function at the end of days. All right. We'll pick up there tomorrow morning. But right now, tonight, don't forget, we're back in the book of Romans. And have you noticed how Romans keeps tying into a lot of the things we're teaching today? Romans is the theological foundation of salvation by faith salvation by grace. We'll see you tonight, seven o'clock.